Jeff's going to talk about Moby Dick. Do you all, you all know what Moby Dick is? Do you know why you're here? You came to a talk not knowing what it's about? Okay. So, Moby Dick is mobile digital computer. Mobile is a relative term. It was in two 30 foot tractor trailers. It was designed, this used to be a secret army electronic research lab, and it was designed here in 1956. And they built the first one here, and then it was Sylvania in Massachusetts built six of them. Um, in 53, three years prior, the Bureau of Standards in DC, which is now NIST, they had a computer called Diceac, which was 240 for trailers, but that was a one off prototype. I loathe the F word first in computer history, but if you put a gun to my head, you can say it's the first production mobile computer. Now, laugh about mobile, ha ha, right? Because two thirty for trailers. But the point is, roughly for the first time, a computer could go where the problem was and said the problem being what where the computer was. And if the problem was envisioned as the Battle of the Europe, the computers that it did, you know, in California or New York, that's a big problem. What if you could read the computer where it was? Big advancement. Um, the idea wasn't new. They had, you know, telegraph equipment and horse drawn carriages in the Civil War. But they did a computer. Anyway, um, so I wrote a book a couple years ago called Abacus to Smartphone, The Evolution of Mobile and Portable Computers. A little plug there about my book. And there's a whole chapter or two about Moby Dick. I'm infatuated with it because it happened here. This is where our computer museum is. Um, and um, anyway, that's roughly the story of the computer. There are none left. We have a little teeny tiny piece of one in our museum, which will be open tomorrow and Sunday. And so Jeff got interested in it, and he making an emulator using an Arduino. Um, and uh, last year, one of our exhibitors, Doug Crocker, did an exhibit on Kermit, the networking protocol. As a joke, I said to him, bring a little Kermit frog. I thought he'd bring a little four foot tall toy. He brought a four foot tall Kermit. Had it sitting on his table with legs sitting on the end. So I challenged Jeff to get a whale, and he did a good job. Um, yeah, I didn't get a whale of a whale. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah. joking up ahead, I better not say it. Um, before Jeff gets into the technical side, does anyone have any historical questions about Moby Dick? What did they use for power? Generators. One truck was CPU, one truck was power and oh, so yeah. it, was, um, it was one and one. Right, and it was used mostly. Uh, you know, they had command and control, sort of Star Wars applications, not the movie, like the 80s Star Wars applications of mine. They also used it for inventory, something called Project Mass, modern army surplus system. Um, general purpose computer, ran at one megahertz. So they get trying to make it a commercial version called 9400, they sold two of them, and ran at two megahertz. Only one was ever actually delivered. Um, and the other cool thing about Moby Dick is that it was basically the first computer to talk in a common format to other computers and other makes and models, as opposed to just telegraph, auto code, or whatever else. And that was called field data, also developed here at Camp Evans, and field data became ASCII, which you all still use today. So, that's uh, Moby Dick. Did you talk about the uh, water Humphrey here? Humphrey? Yes, yes, yes. So on the Sylvania side, it was a man named Watts Humphrey, oh, who um, in 1987 wrote a 25 page article for the IEEE Hamilton Digital <laughs> Computing, about his experience of Moby Dick from the Sylvania side. He came here, gave a lecture, it's on a YouTube site. He passed away a few years ago, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, but now just talk about his emulator. His writings were instrumental in efforts to reverse engineer the system. Yeah, yeah. And you know, uh, this year in the exhibit hall, there's not really a big iron that has been in the past, but we have our Univac running in our museum and an emulator of a 60 feet of tractor trailer. So that's some pretty big iron, sort of. Okay, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. He needs some water. No, there you go. <laughs> Enjoy. All right. Um, yeah, Watts Humphreys gave a uh, kind of like a more abstract discussion on what the whole Moby Dick and, and you know, um, Evan also mentioned the Sylvania 9400 system, which is a commercial version of it. Um, whereas there was no technical details. You can look at the YouTube video. He talks about a lot of stuff, how it was created, the logistics behind it, you know, the, the business stuff behind it. Um, what I stepped into, what I tasked myself to do because I, I like a good challenge, is to reverse engineer the, the details. You know, what makes this thing tick and can I reproduce it today? So this is a work in progress. And it's going to be a work in progress for uh, whenever I took on the project and stick with it. Um, Oh, I'll get started through here. 
Movie Deck Basics. Uh, the Movie Deck is similar yet different to what we know today. Modern computers, and you'll find throughout my presentation, I equate modern to like the 70s and 80s early personal computer stuff, because that's what we can all relate to here. Uh, similarities to the uh, 1975 and greater computers are they have the von Neumann architecture, which means you have input, processing in memory, the core part of the computer, and some sort of output. It also has RAM storage, it's something archaic or anything. It's, it's um, stored RAM and it's a uh, transistorized, if I recall. There's nothing to build integrated circuits in this whatsoever. It was designed in the late 50s, early 60s. Magnetic storage is available. Uh, you have tape and punch card, used for you know, other kind of hard storage. And then there's output. Output can be to a teletype, it could be to, you know, there's your paper output to punch cards. And there's also some on screen idiot lights or on control panel idiot lights that I'm trying to represent here. Now, the difference is with more modern computers is it's got a 38 bit architecture. So we're not talking 8, 16, or anything like that, we're talking 38 bit. It's an odd amount, um, but each 38 bits. So one byte of RAM, so to speak, is actually considered a word, and one word is one byte of RAM. So if the system has 4K of memory, it has 4,038 bit pieces of RAM. Uh, what we know is bytes today, smaller pieces, more than one byte can fit into a word in RAM, and uh, for example, a 38-bit word might contain the um, CPU op, op RAM, the op code, um, and any values that go along with it for that op code to do its job. Whereas the more modern architecture you have, you have a value, and the next byte has you have the op code, the next byte has its value, and maybe some other information one or two bytes later. Do they have a checksum? There is a checksum. 38 bit is actually the checksum. It's a parity, um, single bit parity. I'm not going to use that in emulation because modern systems are a little more reliable. Yeah. But yeah, back then when you had all that hardware heating up, yeah, you wanted to have that parity bit. Most of the concepts in um, Movie Deck are octal based. Um, Personally, I have a hard time wrapping my head around the use of octal because there's only three bits to work with, and it's just not the way I think. Uh, but you'll see later as I demonstrate some of the word, uh, the words that are just get sort of memory how octal fits in. Timing functions. Oh, and by the way, please interrupt any time if you have any questions. This is still a learning process for me, and I may either have. Uh, you know, a few mistakes in here. Yeah, go ahead. So when you say 38 bits, that, that was including the parity bit or no? That's including the parity bit. Okay, so it's only 37? 37 bits, and in some, some words, the 37th bit is a sign bit when you're working with numbers. But yeah, 38 bits. So what they physically wired in the movie deck system is 38 bit wide memory. And then the bus, you'll I'll talk about the bus later, everything that communicates to all the portions of Moby Dick subsystems is 38 bits wide. So everything moves 38 bits at a time. The timing function, um, there's one megahertz clock on the Moby Dick. I haven't told you about the two megahertz clock on the newer commercial version, the Sylvania 9400. Modern computers, the, the timing, basically you have a few um, clock cycles to execute one CPU command. This works a little different. This actually has a timing control. It's a timing function that's called. There's eight timing functions, and each one of them is a step in the process. And I'll, I'll explain that in detail. It's not quite straight through X amount of uh, clock cycles per op code. There's the whole procedure. It's sort of like a regular um, aspect. And with those timing cycles, it, it can allow the movie deck to handle a set of actions to pull information from memory for the next command, while still have a command being executed at the same time. So that's how they tend to speed things up. I'm not going to go over aqua format. I had this in my thing here. I'm going to go straight to the uh, instruction. This will be one example of a 
Um, here's 36 bits for the instruction. This is, these are your op codes and all the data you're going to work with. You have the op code in the first six bits. There are 54 op codes that can be represented in uh, six bits alone. So the first part of a byte of memory is the op code. The index is bit 7 through 9. That references one of seven index registers that are in the system. And index registers are used to do address calculations, to have a base address, and then index it to something a number of bytes later to pull data. Modifier, that's depending on the opcode, the modifier is going to have a certain value that allows that opcode to perform its function. And then the address of it's uh, 15 bits wide, the address is 15 bits wide. That is the memory address that that opcode is supposed to work with. So when the opcode executes, it uses that address to go get the value it needs to do whatever that opcode is designed to do, whatever that CPU command is designed to do. And I forgot I uh, did this line by line here. Uh, the names they gave it, you know, the index is actually also called the gamma portion. The modifier is called the beta portion, the address is called the alpha portion, some terms that they used in their documentation. Other word types. So you have this 38 bit wide memory here. It could be used as what they call a conventional data word. You have a magnitude value, this is just the numeric value. 36 bits can be used for magnitude. You can store uh, Actually, it's not signed integers, it's unsigned integers up to 68 billion, or billion and some odd. I mean, you have a 36-bit wide word, that's going to be a very large integer number. There is a signed bit, the 37-bit, it says S, that's a signed bit, so. Um, actually, yeah, I guess it would be this, positive or negative, because of that extra bit. But it's up to the programmer to decide to use the byte of memory in that fashion. Here's where Aqua comes in, Aqua data word. It just basically slices it up every three bits. And you'll have the number zero through seven, so you can represent Aqua data that's been encoded in base eight instead of binary or base 10 or anything. And that can, there's a sign bit for that too if you want to use it, depending on how the programmer writes their software. Then there's an alphanumeric word. Now we're breaking down the 36 bits into uh, six bit segments, and each one can, can contain a field data code. I was talking about the field data code, which is a, you know, came out before ASCII. So, this is basically you can store six characters information in, in one byte. And once again, the programmer decides how they want to use this. But this is a, a common form of data storage. And believe it or not, the Bobadick will actually do floating point. Um, and this was a tough one to figure out what they're talking about. I'm not a big numbers person. I know what floating point is. I just never heard it called characteristic of magnitude when they break it down. I don't know who, who's familiar with how computers store floating point. Do you think you can explain it in two minutes? Well, I, I'm familiar with it, but I couldn't give you a, my understanding. You now, a dissertation. I I've been working with you know that kind of stuff for over 50 years. Okay. My understanding with this is, let's say you have a floating point number, so it's going to have something in front of the decimal, something after the decimal. You convert Antissa. both of those to byte. Yeah, the mantissa and the exponent. Is that what it is? Right. Sounds right. Um, and not then, familiar. I'm sorry. That's, that's the terminology. I'm okay. With it, it, you know, you've got to remember the 1950s or 1960s. They may call it, you know, two shades of red are called the same color between you know two periods of time. Um, but it'll store. I don't know what, how large of a value, but it will store and work with floating point numbers. Uh, some of the earlier 8-bit processors didn't touch floating point at all. That was up to what so, you had to write your own programs to handle floating but, point. This will handle it natively. When you say natively, as in there are instructions for it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are actually uh, opcodes for handling floating point. The thing, so it's hardware floating point, not mm -hmm. emulated or something? Sort of hardware because the opcodes are hardware are hardwired into the system. It does handle that. I'm just going to move on a little bit because okay. I'll, I'll show some of the commands that did that. 
All right, any questions so far on some of the basics of how a Moby Dick handles RAM and uh, what it does for processing its it bit, bit size? So I had to do a lot of research to get to that point to figure out what exactly makes this tick, what are the pieces on this thing, and how can I start to recreate it in a more modern environment. So, recreating Moby Dick, I thought bringing a trail of computing to a bread box. Right now I'm doing stuff with this Arduino. It's actually an Arduino Mega. It's uh, basically a microprocessor system that you can program using a language very similar to C or JavaScript. And there's probably as much computing power in there, if not more, than what the Moby Dick was capable of. My only limitations on this were RAM size. I have X amount of RAM, and but since the RAM is considered 8-bit, I have to do what is it, three, four bytes of RAM just to emulate one byte of Moby Dick RAM. So that's where I had to figure out how am I going to manage that? How am I going to take 8-bit RAM and turn it into 38-bit and still manage it? But before that, I had to decide if I wanted to do emulation or simulation. And there is a small difference between the two. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, the advantages of emulation are, if you emulate a piece of hardware, you're designing it to be cycle exact, to make it do exactly what it was originally built to do, including all the bugs and anything like that that's, that's in there. You want to make it, you basically want to recreate old technology with new technology. And when, it, when you can get it that way, any original source code that you, or program that you throw at it should work exactly like it did before with the original system. Um, it also allows for perfect interfacing. If you have an I.O. port for a tape reader on your emulated system, then and, and you, you emulated the lines that go in, you should be able to plug in the device and it won't work straight off, off the top. Uh, simulation, the advantage of simulation, you have function over form. If you decide to make it a work-alike system, then you can make it do what it was intended to do, not worrying about how they did it in the first place. So you're not limited by specific designs to make things, you just make things appear to work, and for the most part, 99% of functionality is good enough for a lot of this stuff. Plus with simulation, you can improve on core functionality. As you were asking Jeff about the uh, um, the floating point stuff, yes, it's hard. It's it's hardwired into it, but with uh, modern software, I can implement floating point in a different way. Especially in, in the past, what four or five decades, um, if the handling of floating point values uh, are are better from a computing standpoint or not, and that's adapting modern computing techniques. And it allows for versatile simulation platforms. I can do it as a PC application, I can do it as a microprocessor, or I can do it using uh, their programmable data rays, which are basically, it's a piece of silicon that when you write software for it, it turns it into a custom functional chip. The disadvantage of the reach for emulation, you have technology gaps. It may have been easy back then to wire up transistorized computers, but it's a little difficult to do today. Uh, money, availability of parts, and the analogy is, uh, the best analogy I can think of is, how do you take a transistor and create it in software? It's, it's hard to do. Um, plus, and this is for those like me with a little bit of OCD complex, um, you have a propulsion to make perfect examples if you try to emulate it. You want it to be exact. If you have that mindset, you're going to be working on it for the rest of your life and never get it exactly the way you think it should be. Um, especially with the Moby Dick having all the different models, like the, the Moby Dick B, D, 7A, and the 9400. So for simulation, existing system source code, um, when you simulate it, if you, you can feed it the original programming. It may not work without modification because you're writing a simulator. You're writing what you think an opcode is supposed to do when it's executed by the computer. And it may just crash on you because programmers are taking advantage of little hardware tricks. 
I don't know if anybody ever did uh, 6502 or 6510 programming for like Commodore computers. A lot of the programmers would know that there's secret codes on the CPU and they'll, they'll use that. And uh, if somebody created a Commodore 64 emulator, they'd have to be able to mimic that. And, and it helps to know that you were there. I don't know what the movie that can or can't, can't do because we can't find a working model. And with simulation, um, the disadvantages are overlooked hardware bugs. I just told you about that one. Hidden features that we built into it, and I use the 6502 hidden opcodes as an example. Plus, with simulation, you may introduce new bugs. You know, and you attempt to make it look like what you think it's supposed to do, it may end up doing something else later, and you'll be uh, tracing those problems later on. But it's, it's the love of the game, right? So after winning those, I have my solution is I want to I want to fully understand the Mojave system. So I'm reverse engineering a lot of information from basically other people's secondhand writings. I only have one actual set of operating manuals from Sylvania for their commercial 9400 that I can take as tried and true information, but the other documentation written by people who were trying to you know, go from memory, write down what they knew of the uh, items. So, going with, um, I want to design, test, and tweak the system one step at a time. This is just basically going through the clock cycles and doing stuff. It's looking at memory, displaying memory, showing a program counter. These, this is actually counting up and asking, or and I'm sorry, in uh, uh, binary. And that's the program counter, that's the memory address it's looking at. Um, I also want to eventually, once I get that done, be able to connect standard teletype input, teletype output. We have uh, tape drives and paper punch drives in the museum that we can uh, try to hook up. We want to be able to emulate all that stuff, so one step at a time allows me to, to do this. Get one thing function, go to the next, not try to design the whole system at once. Um, and the um, Anybody familiar with the Moore's Law? Yeah, how technology seems to double in capacity and features, and what is it, every 15, 18 months or something? 18 like that, 15 months. Uh, but we can get away from ourselves because now I'm trying to remodel a 38 bit architecture, 8 bit. Um, but because of the added capacity and how we can shrink things and have more uh, core functionality just at a microprocessor level. That gives me more tools to work with to make 38-bit work in an 8-bit environment. So I decided my target system was going to be the Sylvania 9400, primarily because I have documentation, better documentation for it. Um, it'll still run all the old Moby Dick source code for the source code that's available. I only found two pieces, and it's on paper written as assembly language. So that's, that's my test. I can also, once I get it together, write what they call a hello world program to make it blink a few lights a certain way. Um, but the, the commercial version, the Sylvania 9400, it's designed to run faster, but it adds a few extra opcodes for, for simulation and, and stuff. It, it, um, I don't have to do the original Moby Dick, but the, the Sylvania 9400 simulation will make it look like one. And quite honestly, who's going to care about the minor differences? Uh, we're just creating a machine that doesn't exist anymore. And it's not going to be a mission critical system. So, some of my design considerations this is getting down to the hardware itself. Review of Moby Dick memory Moby Dick has 4,096 words, it's expandable to 28,672 bytes of RAM, all 38 bits. So, multiply that by four, and that's how many. Uh, bytes RAM I have to use on the Arduino environment. Words are synonymous. Yes? Well, what did they actually use for memory? It's all transistorized. Oh, I think they had some magnetic memory. So they didn't cores. have any cores. Yeah. They had cores. Oh. But for processing through the system, like for the bus, it's all transistorized. Like I worked on the 1620 and we had a core thing. Yeah, it does have a core. I didn't physically see it, and I'm still learning stuff about what was there. There's no descriptions, no writing about that? It's just the assumption that it's there. 
So that's the other part. So it was considered to be core memory. Mm -hmm. They called it that. That's before my time, so I'm like I said, I'm learning things on this. But my understanding of core is like like the magnetic core of memory. Sixteen point. Right. So hey, I don't mind learning both ways in this. Um, so, so I know since I last year my exhibit was about core. Mm -hmm. So um, it's safe to just say most core memory you read or wrote. There are a few oddities, but unless you see an opcode... Simulation would go down that far. Right. Simulation just makes sure, can we get the stuff done and not worry so much about the timing, the yeah, actual critical timing. And going from 38 bit to 8, you probably with pulling your hair out, because you have enough timing, you just yep. get, get bites all over. That's right, because then I have to, yeah. I have to abstract some of that to right. say yes. this module is 38 bit. Right. Right. I have a problem. And then just another review of how a single byte of uh, Moby Dick memory is laid out. So opcode six bits, the index value is three bits, the modifier is twelve bits. Here's yeah, another odd number, uh, and the address is fifteen bits. Now to emulate Moby Dick with modern hardware, I, I have to figure out how I'm going to encapsulate thirty-eight bits, especially since the memory can be broken down into little pieces like that. Myself here. Um, the Arduino environment and most other microprocessor environments can do 8, 16, 32, and it can do 64 bit. It's an it's a 8 bit system, but the Arduino programming environment can handle 64 bits, but it's not that um, manageable. It also can tend to have some bugs. I tried, it failed. I thought of a different way of doing it. Um, well, I really did repeat myself here. So what I did for for every piece of movie dick memory or even a sub portion of it that I got to keep track of, I just used the next larger value uh, for a six bit for the opcode. I used eight bit. Uh, uh, variable to handle that. Uh, for uh, anything that's 12 bit, I use a 16 bit. For anything 15 bit, I use 16 bit. For anything greater than 32 bits, which is the, uh, uh, I can do 32 bit without any problems. Anything greater than 32 bits, I actually had to break it down into two pieces of memory to handle like a high side and the low side of the memory. So each byte of RAM is handled from programming perspective by two programming arrays. One is a 32-bit, which I call the low side of memory, the, the, the 32 bits on the right, when you saw that thing, and then another 8 bits on the high side. And that'll give me 40 bits to work with. There'll be some unused bits, but I can manage it in two separate arrays. I can just kind of draw a line where I need to pick one side of it off or the other. And I use a value called RAM side. This is actually some of the pieces of, the piece of the coding that I use to define the memory in the system. RAM size, I just type a value and say this machine has 1,000 bytes, and I'll just define RAM size as 1,000, and it will do everything else in its own. Some Arduinos don't have that much memory. I started out with a smaller Arduino, and I can only do 100 bytes of memory before I ran out of space. So as I mentioned earlier, a program counter 15 bits, I use a 16-bit variable for it. Uh, the bus is 32 and 8 bits. The instruction register, which is 60 bits, that's where the opcode is. And then the instruction register is actually a separate uh, Moby Dick register, which keeps a copy of the opcode, so it, Moby Dick can continue to do its stuff. That's 8 bits. So I had like unused bits sitting around. And this is a graphic, kind of explains how I sliced the dice The program counter, itself is a 16-bit and only need 15 bits, so I have one unused bit I've never been work with. The bus, the bus low, there's the first 30 bits. I picked 30 instead of 32 because all the other word types that I showed you can be almost easily sliced right there at 30 bits. Um, the bus high is the top six bits of the uh, 36 bits that are used to control the bus. I'm not worried about 37, well, 37 bit I didn't implement yet. That's the sign bit. But it's there if I want to use it. I just didn't represent it here yet. 
So this line here is the instruction. There's the opcode in the first six bits. Here's the index, the three bits of the index, the 12 bits of the modifier, and 15 bits of the address. So I broke that one word down into two hands, three components on one side, one on the other. The data word that uses all 36 bits, I just uh, split it. I'll just write the code to know how to put it back together when I need to reference the value. Octal breaks easily every three bits with two remaining bits, or two remaining octal uh, nipples uh, on the high side. Same thing for the alphanumeric characters, the ASCII characters, or field data characters. I just have one orphan down here, it's nip, but I can still, through programming, put it back together. And this is floating point. This is where I had a problem. Um, you have the magnitude portion of floating point. That, that does, I think, the part to the right of the decimal point, I think it's how it's stored, where the characteristic is they take something to be able to put the, the, the decimal point back in its spot. It's some weird, it's some incant incantation uh, or whatever, but they, they break it into two parts, characteristic and magnitude. Unfortunately, characteristic is seven bit. So this became a little bit of a problem to deal with. I'm not gonna do much with floating point at first. I'm gonna implement that as needed. So this is how I was able to break down the memory. I'll just write computer program structures that will just do all the magic behind the scenes for me uh, to manage all that. And that took a lot of time to figure out. But that, that's the challenges we have, taking these old systems and trying to basically crowbar them into new environments. Any questions on this before I move on to the next slide? CPU. The core of any programming system is the CPU. The central processing unit on this is not unlike other uh, CPUs, more modern ones. Uh, there's where I redefine modern the 70s and 80s single core CPUs of the Z80, the 6502, 6510, and some of the other ones, some of the earlier Intels also. Um, but this CPU incorporates what the more modern systems would use external chips for, things like uh, PLA to address memory or to control how memory is addressed, to what they call the blue logic, which ties all the input and output stuff together. Uh, the CPU is basically a director of operations. Uh, a lot of stuff goes on inside the CPU. But it only has two basic sections. The control section will decode and implement the CPU functions. It will do the instructions and the commands. But it will also manage data flow and direct I.O. processes to make sure data can get in and out. Um, and so, so you have full data flow without any errors. Everything is done within the central processing unit to manage it. And plus it has a math section. Uh, the arithmetic section, that's where it does all its calculations. And that's where your hardwired flow points up. Okay. And like modern CPUs, there's registers that are used by the CPU to help do its job. First thing is the instruction register, and, they, and I'm using in parentheses what they coded it as on the documentation. It's a six-bit register that holds the currently queued CPU opcode. So when an op, when an instruction is brought in from memory, a copy of the opcode goes into the instruction register. And this is why it's easy for me to break apart some of this stuff, because I just move them into separate variables. So I represent this by a 8-bit variable. Decoder register. This also receives the opcode, but from the hardwired standpoint, the, the, the design of the Moby Dick, when something goes into the decoder register on the original Moby Dick, it acts as the event trigger. It actually then causes the CPU to go into action once that's written to. Now, if I were to emulate that, I could do that, but I don't need to do anything with this so much because I don't want the program to necessarily trigger by setting a value to it. Uh, and that's where simulation allows me to override some of the original processing. But based on the actual hardware, any time the machine wrote to the decoder register in hardware, the CPU woke up and did something. Uh, the G register, that's a three bit register, I can hold that in an eight bit value. And that holds the, the instruction part. Remember what I said the gamma part, the, the three bit instructions? That's broken out, putting it put into the G register. 
the X register holds that modifier portion that was the beta portion in that diagram, 12 bits. And let's see, address register, that was the last 15 bits. This is the address that the, uh, that the instruction is going to be operating on. There's also a T register. And this is part of the timing function that I was talking about, and I'll get into a little bit later. This register, the timing function is one microsecond slots. So you have eight microseconds to complete a whole CPU action for a single instruction. But the T register, some instructions take more than eight microseconds. So the T register is, takes one of the timing functions and makes it longer. And this tracks the length of that. So we can actually stretch out that eight microseconds to as long as it needs to be while other processes are hotter than the process. This is how they handle, like floating points, but it take an awful lot of computational time. This is how they handled it in the basic flow, which I'll get into the flow of uh, the CPU in a bit. But they have all these registers to handle stuff. And for a 9-bit register, I'd be using a 16-bit variable. Program counter, and that's what this is. Showing. They call it address on some of their uh, documentation. They call it program counter. Somewhere else. And then there's a program store, which is similar to the program counter, but two specific um, CPU instructions use that. It's not used universally. And these CPU instructions, I have to figure this stuff out myself. There's no documentation on how these work. They tell you what they're supposed to do. It's up to me to implement every single one of them. Sounds like a, uh, a subroutine it was intended to put you up to subroutine or something to save and go back. Uh, what for these? Yeah, most like the, the, the T the T commands are transfer commands. So yeah, it wouldn't be something like that. And then index registers. Um, index registers. There's four index registers on the original Moby Dick. It can be expanded to seven. The Sylvania ninety four hundred just has seven, and they're all fifteen bit registers. They can be loaded with the value that the next command can be used to use to use as an offset or an extra value to work with instead of having to keep searching through memory for things. CPU timing. Modern computers, the CPU basically controls everything. That's the timing. When the CPU works a command, it's done with it, it goes to the next command, it tells the rest of the computer what it needs to do the job. Moby Dick uses something called the basic machine cycle, called the BMC. And this is a cycle of events, these are the eight timing function. Step. So the BMC is kind of like a ringleader. Everything starts from the BMC. Um, everything's coordinated by it. But the CPU is an actual, actually in charge of system operations to make sure that everything gets done within the time frame. Basic machine cycle is a repeating eight-step sequence of events which coordinate memory access. It, it tells the system when to do memory access, Tells the CPU when to start decoding instructions. Tells it when to start implementing the instructions. It also is used the time when index variables are, or index addresses are to be computed, and when the actual CPU registers get populated, when a new instruction comes up. And that's called the timing function. And there are lights on the original control panel that show what timing function is, is operating next. And each timing function step is one microsecond in duration, but some, uh, time, uh, some timing functions can be extended. And these are the different steps, and this gives you an idea of what goes, goes on. And this I had a hard time with because I think a CPU is you, know, you get your instruction, you have a value to work with, and you have a memory address to work with it. So you should get the CPU instruction first, right? You could at least you think that. The first timing function already assumes you have an instruction ready to go. It gets the operand, the value from memory that the instruction is supposed to work with. I'm still trying to figure out where to start my computer if I want to start it at timing function one or later on with timing function four when it actually starts getting the, the next opcode. But I'm just going to go through this list here. So each step, so one step, one pulse, one millisecond or microsecond. Operand arrives at the memory output register, one of the CPU registers. 
then the operand itself is rewritten into memory. Memory access in the Moby Dick is really weird. It'll, and it might be because of the core memory function. It's pulled from memory, worked with, and then rewritten back into memory. I don't know if that's for refreshing. I don't know. The reads on um, core memory are destructive. You have is it to write back. Okay. And the point is, where is it? That, okay. Sometimes that's in the memory controller, sometimes mm -hmm. it's visible, as you just said. So that explains why they have to rewrite it into memory. See, I don't need to do that See, with the simulation. But that has to do with timing as well. Yes. If, you, if the memory controller reads and writes back automatically, yep. that takes essentially two cycles. Okay. If you read without writing back, it's, it'll, it's faster. But you are now responsible for putting it back. Okay. So it has to do that with the, that's so that's uh, why the technology and the timing go together. And they had their work cut out for them back then when they were designing this for that reason. But they were more familiar with core memory than I was. Uh, but that does help me with this. I don't necessarily need to emulate that, which is good. Um, but it's nice to know that the, the problem though is if it modified it before writing it back, then you have to. Then that's something you have to. Uh, uh, as um, emulate, it may have been a read modify right cycle. I guess I'll find that out when I start detailing or so getting the, into all the opcodes and the, and the CPU instructions. It's free to modify and write something else back. It doesn't have to be okay. the same. Warning, warning, one real Robinson. Let's see, I have for time. So go here. Um, Timing function three, any I.O., anything you're supposed to talk to, an input or an output, gets processed during timing function three. Uh, timing function four is when you, the program counter has the address of the next instruction. It goes into the memory address register, which is basically the front door to the core memory, and then it sends a read pulse to memory. So that's when it then brings that value out of that memory address and puts it um, into memory output register in the next timing function. There's a lot of stuff going on here. And then once that's out, timing function six will copy the appropriate segments. This is basically, it, it, it breaks up that instruction word into its individual pieces and starts um, putting things into the CPU registers. Timing function seven, the address goes up by one, ready for the next loop around. Um, and then during this process, the CPU also does any index value calculations to, to change the address that the uh, opcode is to be uh, referencing. And then once that address has been determined, then memory address register is uh, set that value so that this is where the operand is. This is the value that the uh, instruction is supposed to work on. That operand then comes to um, the front out of memory and then now we look back and there's where our operand arrives at the memory output register. And over and over again. However, while this is running, this just controls input and output to the memory mostly and, 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 and staging everything. This is an example of the, of the add command. It just basically adds two numbers. So during the same timing cycles, we actually have two things that can run at the same time. It's like multitasking. Uh, timing function one, nothing happens. Timing function two, while an operand is being rewritten to memory, the CPU is processing the operand, taking it from the memory output register that was done here, and puts it into a register called the B register. It's like a temporary storage for mathematical operations. And then while uh, any I.O. stuff is... Okay, but that was all individual there, there's, there's some, yeah, it's mostly individual art. I've never seen one in person. We only have a few yeah. pictures. I have a few photographs, I have a few schematics of individual transistor uh, circuits. Did it have the divide instruction? Yes, it did. The it divide, divide multiplication. I, I worked with the computer that could not divide. Yeah, this one could divide, but it probably did it as, well, I know the uh, Sylvania 9400 did it by... Continuous subtraction? Yes, but it was still a single instruction for the CPU. All the magic was done in the hardware. And that's, and that's where simulation versus emulation is a lot nicer because I can just use a few subtract functions or divide functions to achieve the same result instead of trying to do an emulation repeated subtraction for a divide. Yeah, I'm email at work. Okay. I'm going to tell me there's food at work. I'm too far away. Um, 
Any questions on, on the basic machine side? Do you know anything about the physical boards and, and Not racks? Not much, just like, that has like Xerox pictures. Uh, now eventually, um, I'm going to look into detail and see how it is, just out of my own curiosity. Now since this was such a high high level security, how did Sylvania get into this? They, they designed the movie, it was, it was just like any other government thing, people bid for it, or organizations, companies bid for it. So Sylvania was one of the bidders. So the, so the design was not on this property? Yes. Oh, Evan knows more people. about that history of it. Oh. Um, he knows more about That's how right. it came to fruition here. But this was this was the Signal Corps Center um, decades ago, and Signal Corps was responsible for computers back then. Here's the basic machine cycles, clock pulses. First clock pulse, TF1 is executed. TF2, 3, 4. TF5 is the one that can be extended. And if you saw in the, the previous slide, TF5, housekeeping, or any extended functionality, especially for the more complex functions, are handled in TF5. So TF5 is the one that can be extended to spread out the length of that particular pulse. So it might take three CPU, or three clock cycles, three microseconds, three clock cycles to do this, but it's still one TF5 timing function. That was the, uh, it was a six-bit register, I think, uh, was that, or was that something? Something register was the operator. No, there was a, a one about um, timing. Oh, nine bits. Okay. There's nine bits. That is or is not related to this. That's related to that's that is what controls this timing here for TF5 to extend. If if the uh, instruction requires an extension of time, it controls. It just manages that there. I didn't look at the details of that. I just know that's where it's going to happen, and eventually I'm going to be implementing it. And then TF6, seven, and then it starts over again, just over and over again, just all the pulses. CPU instructions, I'm not going to detail the instructions, I'm just going to kind of show you what it is capable of doing. It has fixed and floating point arithmetic functions, functions for data transfer, program control, sensing input, uh, index control. Indexes are very big in this, just to compute new addresses, so you can do certain loops or whatnot. Um, address modification, which is sort of part of index control and word modification, so things can be done to modify uh, the actual data, or you can actually modify the instruction itself. So some of the fixed point arithmetic is quite a bit here. Uh, clear and add, clear and add magnitude, I don't remember the difference because of the term magnitude. Um, there, there is a subtle difference, but they implemented because that's what their needs were. Uh, there's your there's subtract, there's well, clear net, everything works through something called an accumulator. It's a single register which holds a, a computed value. So the clear and add, and clear and subtract, clear the accumulator first to get it ready for a new number. That's like the clear accumulator calculator. Add and subtract, work with the existing value of the accumulator. Same thing with multiply and divide. Those, those that work independently, they don't necessarily work with the accumulator, they do their own thing to produce a value in a memory address. And then we can shift bits. In computing terms, shifting bits is basically like multiplying by two or dividing by two. For each shift, you multiply the number by two. Shift to the left, shift to the right, you divide so by two. That's, that's a binary function, like yes. that. Yep. Now, of course, as bits fall off one side of the byte, you lose precision. And there's a normalized one. I don't know the details on that. Um, I can look it up, but I've never seen anything even close to being called normalized in the modern CPU. But one of these days I'll have to. I, that sounds like a floating point thing. It might be. Um, because when you, when you do arithmetic you, and you have leading zeros, yeah. that's wasted space. If you Yep. Push it over and now you can get. Uh, I want to write about how it stores floating point. Yes, it tries to eliminate wasted space. That might be correct in this end. And it'll do the basic uh, four functions for floating point, too. All handled, all hardwired in the, in the system. And this should still be, this should actually be pretty easy to emulate or simulate with modern things. I just do the multiplication divide and I just use floating point uh, variables to do 
people of magic for me. A typical floating point number is one point something times ten to the x. Yes, and that exponent, what I understand, so becomes a characteristic as, as a story. May, may allow for the left digit to be one. Yep, and I think yeah, there was a characteristic and magnitude portion of the floating point word. I think that exponent is what's used to help define what the characteristic value is. Um, and it's, it's also added with some special secret number that's calculated to be able to be reverse engineered and put back to whatever floating point number it is with X amount of uh, numbers before the decimal point and X amount of the after. Data transfer, that's getting the course of what? Store value, load value, value. Where they go to, where they go from, I have yet to read the documentation. Uh, program control. These are all, every time a computer runs, it has to make a decision eventually. That's what this is. Different transfer conditions. Uh, TRU. TRU means just move to this memory address, start computer, computer from there. That's like a go to and basic if you have to work with that. Transfer on accumulator, or zero accumulator, you can see you're doing constant division or subtraction for whatever reason, or you're counting something, once the value gets to zero, it'll branch to a new address. A lot of this stuff you'll see similarly named in modern CPUs, but it can make all sorts of decisions based on certain uh, actions, like um, if the number goes negative in a memory address, we'll do one thing, if it doesn't, we'll do another. Sensing. Uh, you can actually, there, there's other inputs for like switches, and I think you can expand it to just standalone inputs for any external device. And there's commands in there to, to sense that based on, I believe it's the memory address that that um, input has been directly wired to. Some memory addresses are not core memory, they can be directly wired at that address. The PIO will be memory met. Yes, it is. And actually the registers, especially in the uh, Sylvania 9400, the registers are in the top part of memory. You can actually directly address them that way if you wanted to. Yeah. To get the thing started on some of the systems I worked with, you toggle in the bootstrap loader on the switches? You, in this one, you, you toggle the uh, starting address of your program, and then press a button. But, it starts but the program had to be come from somewhere. Yeah, cards you, or you could preload. Yeah, you could bootstrap. Make the tape. Yeah, you could bootstrap stuff for that, or you could put it in by hand, like you know people used to do with those altars. So, so how many switches did they have? A <laughs> lot. <laughs> Thirty-eight switches. You know, if I was going to do this right, I'd have to help you here with these lights. So, so maybe there's a, a picture of that. There is, and I have a couple pictures on here. Index control. Like I said, indexes are used a lot here. I'm not going to go into too much more detail about indexes, but this helps manage that, make things a little more streamlined. Um, like if an index changes, it can do a transfer or a jump. Address modifications. You can replace address, replace the address value. I said I have to read a lot of these. Um, I don't know if I'll be getting into any of these anytime soon. I just want to make this thing run and tell it add one to this register and display that register, just so I know it's going to follow instructions. A lot of this stuff's going to come later, but each one of these has to be individually created and reverse engineered by the simple instructions that they give you as to what it's supposed to do. And these, uh, but the only one here that makes sense to me now without reading further is replace new mask, which I think is actually a neat feature. You can, you can have a value which has a bit mask. Certain bits are one, certain bits are zero. But you can use that as a mask to put another value in, which basically anything with a one in that same bit place gets transferred. Well, that would be Boolean algebra. Boolean algebra, yeah. Masking, um, yeah, you're right. I guess it would be more like doing like an and. Right. Anding it with a certain value. But it's uh, it's in a single instruction here. It's not. It's, um, or maybe this is the predecessor to uh, similar functions. I'm trying to remember all my 6502 op codes. But we have the different names and stuff. Logical add, multiply, negation. I don't know what that is. I have to read further. One last instruction that's actually pretty powerful is the repeat instruction. 
The repeat instruction allows the next instruction it's working on to repeat a number of times. So you don't have to create your own loops. You can tell the system to do this X amount of times. Uh, and the way it works is the instructions address plus the value of, see there's an index register. So if you want it to repeat 10 times, you put the value of 10 in an index register. You tell the repeat command, this is where my index register is. And the address will get, um, replicated. yeah, it will get uh, recalculated. And then the repeat instruction will do all the work of decrementing down to, you know, decrementing 10 times to repeat the next, next function. Loop. Yeah, it's a four next loop in a single command. Mm -hmm. um, APL did something like that. And that's neat, it's just a single instruction part. So you've got basically two bytes of memory doing a lot of work instead of you know, creating a bigger loop. Running out of time here. Data travel and the movement engine. Stuff's got to move around. I'm going to stop me if you have any questions. I'm just going to go through this a little quick. I will have this stuff on display in the next two days. So if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer that. Um, everything goes through the bus. Um, everything. Anytime memory is read, anytime input output goes through, it goes through the bus, including the program counter. Here's a little main transfer bus, 38 bits wide. All IO system goes there. Uh, here's all the, uh, the, the registers in the CPU. They have to go through the bus one way, shape, or form. Uh, there's the arithmetic section. There. See, there's that B register I was telling you about, spare registers, the accumulator. There's the core memory, so yeah, it's written as core memory. All that goes to the bus, including the address to pick and the output of the memory. Front consoles and like I said, and the IO center all goes through the bus. Here's the control panels. This is the top portion of the machine. These are basically used for tape control and other, other stuff. The primary stuff I'm going to work with now, which I was trying to simulate here, is the instruction word register. Just shows all 37 bits of that, so you can see the stats of what's on that register at one time. I ran out of these lights to be able to do that here. There's, I needed 103 lights. I have 100 lights. Uh, program counter, that's what you see going on here, so there's 15 lights there. I just didn't do the 333 gap yet. Um, bus indicator, there's the bus. Uh, timing function, I think, is on the lower right, which is here. There's the timing function. Actually, this is, this is the, uh, the Sylvania 9400 control panel. This is the commercial version. I don't see the timing function lights here. Or there might just be a thin panel that I didn't get a picture of. Um, so here's all your switches to set your master address. Or if you want to write a byte into memory, you would set your address there, and then you can, there's the address, there's the word. So this is your memory input, this is your address. Yes, yeah, so you can set them, and then you can press these buttons. Like here's read out, read in. So you can, you can program this in one byte at a time by setting all the switches, the address, the contents, hit read in, go to the next one. Uh, but yeah, it's easier to feed it with something else that's going to do it automatically. Jeff, can I ask you a favor? Sure. Back up two slides so I can get the the bus picture there? Oh, yeah, sure. I'll be quick. Uh, right there. Yep. Got it, thank you. All right. So yeah, the operators had a lot of uh, blinking lights to look at. <laughs> I know, uh, this, this is pretty much the end of my thing. I.O. is handled by individual processors. I think you can have up to 64 processors, so you can hook up up to 64 I.O. devices at any time, as long as the processor can make, can connect, it's basically a driver, connect the device to the system in a way they both can talk. There's one I.O. device per processor, and each processor itself is a little computer. It has a control section and data handling section. Um, the control section has a processor instruction register and an order sequence register, so it basically has the opcode, its own little opcode, and the order of the opcodes are supposed to run. And it runs asynchronously, asynchronously with the movie deck. So any stuff can be sent out to, uh, say, a printer. And the printer, during that timing function, where you saw the I.O. output stuff going on at TF3, I believe it was, that's its one chance to go get the next byte out of memory, or where it's told to start printing from, or you know, outputting from. Is that because there are its own separate clock for the I.O.? It, it all, no, 
it, it works off the same clock. It's just it's asynchronous in that you can tell it to do something. Here's your memory. Here's what you know. This is how much you need to print or output. Go do it, but it takes its turn. And the other part of the uh, I/O processor was the uh, um, see, processor instruction register. So, like I said, it's like a mini computer. You have op codes that are specific for use for that device. Uh, you have a word block counter which shows how many pieces need to go. So, if, if the op code says like, you need to send this out through a serial port, the next 500 bytes, this will contain the word number 500. Um, this would contain the address to start reading 500 bytes from, and this would be um, pieces of data, the address of core memory the device to pull from. Okay, so this is the address of the device. So the device might be hardwired in at memory address, uh, we'll call it 20,000 decimal. So that's where, that's how it knows where it's going to be, and that's how it can be called too. Basically, you tell what to do, where to get the stuff from, and how many to get, and it'll do it. And the order sequence register, they call it DAS in one way, they call it OSR in another. It's the same thing from what I can tell. I can't find anything else to differentiate it. Um, the DAS register holds the option values for the current IO instructor. So you have an opcode for the device, but then you need a value to work with. And, and this register will hold that. Um, the OSR register works like a program counter, so it has its own little program counter to run through its own little set of instructions. This is a block diagram. It has its own, each, this is this will be one I.O. device. So you have a tra transfer bus that's going to run everything, or going to transfer everything, and you have an in-out processor, so here's a device, here's a device, and there's your magnetic core memory. Uh, and as data goes through, it's handled independently by each of their own buses. So that's how another way that it can run asynchronously. And that's it. I'm still learning stuff on this, but it's getting easier as I as I keep reading. But there's a lot that this thing does. Um, the fact that the I/O devices, mm -hmm. the I/O devices. Apparently, are smart enough that they act. They act. They access the memory directly. Yes, which During is their pretty time. sophisticated because that requires a fair amount of circuitry. Yes, kind of like what the Commodore did with the fifteen forty one disk memory. Sort of, it, it can run on its own, but it, it has its own collection of stuff. But the, that's why this is when the uh, analogy breaks down because eight bit processors went cheap, and you can do it in or out. Mm -hmm. You can do an in or out repeat. But that was not direct memory access. It wasn't a, that wasn't smart like this. You didn't no, just say go. There, there's a lot of genius in what they put into the Moby Dick, but it's still over technology. Uh, they had some good ideas, and yeah, some of those ideas might not transfer very well to uh, anything new, or at least. The cost well, point. mainframes did that. That was the whole point of controllers. That when you throw money at it, anything can happen. <laughs> the uh, the final output you're doing it out. Mm -hmm. It could be uh, field wired and switches, let's say. Yes. Switch contact. Were you right to call memory by hand? to a, a, a relay directly before it had been said that it's your part to go out and do field wiring? Or was it to a transistor output? What exactly did you find that you went to output? Aside from the peripherals that would be required to, to operate in Well, some of the wiring stuff I'm not familiar with. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm extract, abstracting this to a bit. Right. Okay. Um, I want to show something here real quick. Uh, where is it? This is source code that I found online. There is actually an assembler program for the Moby Dick, or actually the, uh, the 9400. It's called 94AP. It's an assembler processor. You load that in like off a punch tape or something, off a right. uh, magnetic tape. It allows you to write your programs kind of like you do for assembler for almost anything else we're used to these days, where you have the instruction, you have a value that goes in, and uh, and you can actually use labels which will determine memory addresses. I like to find that. That'll make things a lot easier, but I don't know if it even exists anymore. I could probably write one, and that would be a big challenge, but that's how they programmed them back then. Or 
you know, sort of flipping switches and writing that magnetic or punch tape for the first time around and just reusing it. But yeah, this is the only thing I have to go off of to know that what I'm building is going to work. This, I think, is a game called Mayflower. I think that's a game that people play. I, I saw something about Mayflower on Wikipedia and it uses moves and stuff like that. So this looks like it's a game. And, I'll, and I'm going to use that Mayflower game that I've never heard of before and adapt it to this to see if I can see, okay, that's what it's trying to do. Did, did you get any screening access? You probably didn't need it on the level of information you want to do, but as far as the last time of the, of the logical levels. Well, I, I won't need to do anything with that, yeah. yeah. I, I don't think the programs, just by glancing through this, I don't think it cares because everything starts and ends with the, the instruction. Right. So nothing subtle in between. Well, we only come into the variable plot cycles if you wanted to extend. You know, what is considered finally a level of truth? Um, well, for, you mean for like extending TF5? Right, yes. That's just going to stop until, because I, I have a, a loop of, I have case statements. I'm using case statements for that. So okay. I just use an, uh, a, an integer to go count from one to seven right. or one to eight and back again. So when it's on five, it'll do whatever it needs to do until it thinks it's done and moves on. So however long that takes, that's how it takes. That's why it's more of a simulation than an emulation. Wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Emulation, yeah, it can be yeah. clock cycles specific. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. But anyway, I know it's a lot to talk about in an hour. And uh, hopefully we'll learn a little something from it. In general, hmm? on, the, on the DCF email list, yeah. there was chatter about actually going together in front Yes, that's what started all this. That, okay. We have a trailer. The tra right, we actually, have a trailer, we have a trailer and then, together. And, then, and Evan said, boy, I think we can go to Home Depot and build front ends and stuff. We could buy some cheap switches, but it still needs something in the back to run. Right. And that's where I said, okay, why not? I'm going to step in and learn something. Right. Everything for me is a learning thing. I, I, this helps me learn some stuff because I don't know do these systems. I, I mean, you know, I, I, my first computer was a Vic 20, and I can go back as far as the Altair. And understand. Right. This is a challenge for me, and it, it's fun. It's also frustrating, but it's one of those things. Like, I like it actually, but it's it's going to take some time. But I'd love to see that thing again. Yeah, very cool. I'll probably just put the board behind the glass and line it up and say, "This is really what's working. Everything else is just for playing games." But yeah, we could we have punch tape and we have tell type out. I like to be able to interface with those directly. Yeah. And that is it. Thank you, sir. Thank you.